Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. So coming at you with the first video of 2024. If you're new here, hi, I'm Megan and I talk about fashion history, fashion, sewing tutorials, and like LGBTQ plus stuff on this channel. So if that's your jam, stick around, hit that subscribe button. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers and it's my goal to get there within the next month. So it would be awesome if you wanted to stick around and if not, that's cool too, you do you. If you've been here before, hi, welcome back. I hope that you all had a fantastic New Year's and holiday season. It's already been a year and we're like seven days in now, so love that for me. Um, I hope that the rest of the year is a little bit quieter, but like somehow I don't think so. But anyway, we'll see what happens. For now, I'm coming at you with a new video about men's fashion and fashion history. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so I thought it's high time that we get back into it. That's what this channel was built on after all, so let's get into it. So a while back, like way before Christmas, I put up a poll on my Instagram stories and on my community tab, and I asked you guys what you wanted to see for my next video, and overwhelmingly the responses were were in regards to men's fashion and why it's so boring. So I immediately set to work researching and scripting and quickly found that there are no shortage of videos on YouTube already on this topic. So not wanting to like rehash something that has clearly already been like examined to death, I thought I would get a little more specific within the bounds of that topic and talk specifically today about the whole Harry Styles Vogue cover thing that happened like a few years back now in 2020 and also just sort of give some historical context to that because there was a huge backlash to it and all of the backlash just like did not take into consideration the actual historical context of like men wearing skirts and dresses because guess what they did and also guess what before like 200 years ago clothing was not as gendered as it is now I mean it was like there were still different clothes for men and for women but things like patterns textures textiles colors were not gendered in the same way that they are now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today and we're going to talk a little bit about um, fashion becoming a little more androgynous, which I'm a huge fan of because I love androgyny. This video has been really fun to research. I've been kind of picking away at it over the past couple of weeks. So without further ado, let's get into it. So one of my favorite fashion trends to come off of the runways in the past few years has been the menswear skirt. I love androgynous aesthetics, as you can probably tell by my like half shaved head and like the fact that I like frequently wear men's clothes and women's clothes at the same time. Um, but this is just like so hot, like the whole idea of like men wearing skirts and dresses and corsets is like, ugh so hot to me. Um, skirts for men have been on the rise for quite a few years now and the very bravest of cishet dudes are starting to embrace them even as right-wing talking heads like Candace Owens from the Daily Wire rail against the decline of manly men. As a bit of a gender bendy queer woman myself, I absolutely adore the fact that fashion is becoming more and more androgynous and I have like oceans of respect for the straight men who are embracing the tides and riding with the times instead of giving in to the temptation to retreat into reactionary, i.e. misogynistic online spaces to complain about how it's a sign that men are being erased or some other nonsense like that. I mean, there are men who are doing that in spades for sure, like there's no shortage of information and videos about that out there either but um, there are a few straight men who are embracing more of that androgynous aesthetic and I have nothing but respect for them so if you're one of those straight guys and you're watching this like love to you you're amazing keep doing what you're doing so since I'm feeling a little gender bendy myself today I'm going to woman splain masculinity to all of you and we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into where all this like anti skirt hysteria is coming from that's right I said hysteria the men folk are just being overly emotional about this if you ask me um, but we're gonna take a look at like where this idea of skirts and dresses being gendered even comes from and is there a historical precedent for it no, there is not. So in December of 2020, Harry Styles 
appeared on the cover of Vogue in a floor-length ruffled gown by Gucci, which was absolutely stunning, by the way, and sparked outrage across all the right-wing media outlets because, of course, it did. Today, we're going to have to cancel Harry Styles again. It's groundbreaking. He's wearing a dress on the cover of a man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And maybe men should actually, you know, act masculine. Women do not like men that wear dresses. Even if they were dating Harry Styles, they wouldn't okay. want him wearing a dress. Yeah. They'd be like, why are you wearing a ball gown today? Harry Styles in a dress is just my type. He looks so handsome. He looks so great. No. Incorrect. <laughs> What they were actually doing by spewing this unhelpful rhetoric was robbing men's skirts of their historical context and meaning, stripping them down, pun intended, to a convenient talking point about how the woke left is trying to erase masculinity. And they say the gays have an agenda. But all of that hysteria just begs the question, where did the idea that skirts aren't masculine even come from in the first place? When you think about it, clothes are literally just strips of woven fibers that we wear on our bodies to keep them warm. Why do we have to assign them a gender? And have we always done this? Or like many things, is the gendering of clothing a social construct subject to place, time, and culture? Step right up, folks. We're going to take a look at all of this and ask ourselves, why aren't skirts masculine anyway? Before we get into it, though, I need to clarify a few things. In this video, I'm going to be talking specifically about men's fashion in the Western world, so basically Europe and North America, and like a little bit of like the ancient Near East as well. There's a whole deep dive I could do about fashion in other places like India and because that is fascinating too, but I don't know much about it and I wouldn't be able to do it justice. So I'm just gonna stick to what I know here and like stick to my own cultural analysis. I also want to clarify that I'm not an expert on this topic by any means. I don't have a degree in fashion history and I haven't written any theses or papers or done any real academic research on the topic. I have done a lot of neurodivergent deep dives, sources below as always, and if you've been watching this channel for a while then you'll know that fashion history is one of my special interests, so I do feel like I know enough to at least make this video. That being said, if this sparks an interest or makes you want to learn more, I will leave some links in the description below from people who really are experts so that you can dive into it more deeply if that's what you want to do. Also, when I talk about fashion in any kind of historical context, I want to be super clear that I'm talking about rich people. Before the 20th century, and actually before the 1960s if we want to get really specific, ordinary working class people did not participate in fashion. That's because fast fashion in its modern form didn't really exist yet, so in order to get new clothes, you would have had to visit a tailor or a dressmaker and have them make clothes specifically for you and your body, which was an expensive and time-consuming process that required you to have A, the money to pay for it, and B, the free time to attend multiple fittings and consultations, which if you were like a working class person, you didn't have either of those things. For like all of human history up to World War I, clothes took a long time to make and textile production was a highly skilled and mostly manual process. Fabric was expensive and it was treated like a precious commodity. Household linens and outer clothing were considered family heirlooms and passed down from parents to children, even in wealthy households. On average, people owned less clothing, even people who were rich, but the clothes they did own would have been bespoke and of a much better quality than anything fast fashion can give us today. If you were an ordinary working class person, then your options for clothing would have been limited in terms of color, cut, fabrics, and styles because you wouldn't have been able to afford luxury textiles like silk, velvet, and imported cotton, nor would you have been able to afford the services of the most talented tailors and dressmakers. A lot of your clothes would have been hand-me-downs and homemade, and if you were a second or third child in the family, then it's possible you would have never owned a brand new piece of clothing in your entire life because generally speaking, new clothes were given to the oldest sibling who got to pick the fabrics and the styles and then they would get passed down to the younger worns as they gradually were worn out. When working class people did spend money on clothing, they would have wanted it to be of the highest quality they could afford and in a style that wasn't too trendy or fashionable because it would have had to last them a lifetime. But rich people could afford to be more cavalier with their clothing choices because they would have been able to afford to have new clothes made more often and also to have old clothes remade as styles changed. 
Because of this, rich people could afford to keep up with fashion. So they were the ones who set the trends and then participated in them. So that's why when I talk about fashion, it's usually always about rich people. Unfortunately, poor and working class people simply couldn't afford to keep up with fashions for like most of human history. So they were effectively barred from participating in fashion until about the middle of the 20th century when synthetic textiles and fast fashion factories made clothing more cheap and accessible. So whenever I talk about fashion on this channel in a historical context, I'm always talking about wealthy upper class people. This is important to keep in mind as we examine the role that fashion played in the lives of men throughout Western history. Skirts are one of the oldest garments worn by humans as they can be made easily just by wrapping cloth around the body and fastening it in place. The oldest known skirt dates back to about 3900 BCE and was discovered in the Areni 1 cave complex in Armenia. It's unclear if this particular skirt was worn by a man or a woman, but historically skirts were worn by everyone, regardless of gender or sex, because they're simple, they're practical, and they allow for ease of movement when performing physical labor, which nearly all prehistoric humans had to do. Skirts were standard for both men and women in all ancient Middle Eastern cultures, which are considered to be the cradle of modern Western civilization. You know, the same culture in which the Daily Wire goons get to pontificate about manly men and the decline of America. In ancient Egypt, men wore kilts made from linen that were tied around the waist, and the fashionable length of the kilt changed throughout Egypt's long history. During the Middle Kingdom, so about 3,500 years ago, men's kilts were floor length. That's right, men wore maxi skirts for like centuries, and there was very little distinction between clothing that was made for men and clothing that was made for women. Both men and women who could afford it wore makeup in the form of black eyeliner and either blue or green eyeshadow, as well as an abundance of jewelry and headdresses. Throughout most of Egypt's history, men and women both shaved their heads as well as their body hair, which kept the lice away and also kept them cool in Egypt's hot desert climate. Fancy braided wigs were worn by both men and women during dinner parties and other special occasions, and were often decorated with jewelry and hair pieces made of gold and semi-precious stones. So I don't want to hear anything about shaved heads not being feminine. Women shaving their heads was the norm for literally thousands of years. There were times during Egypt's history when fashion was a little more gendered, as in women wore dresses and men wore skirts, but in general there was very little distinction between men's clothing and women's clothing throughout most of its reign as the world's most powerful empire. You best believe Amenhotep III, by all accounts a very straight man, conquered all of the Middle East while wearing a skirt and eyeliner. I think even Matt Walsh would be hard pressed to disagree about this being the epitome of take charge masculinity. Like, no one's over here saying Amenhotep III was not a manly man. Like, come on, the dude conquered, like, all of the Middle East, like, led his troops into battle while wearing a skirt. Like, come on. Around 100 BCE, historian Diodorus Siculus noted that men of the Celtic and Germanic tribes wore a chiton, which is basically a one-piece tunic dress that was also worn by both ancient Greek and ancient Roman men. During the Roman Empire, senators, who were all men, wore long white togas, a garment which can only be described as a dress, with a red stripe down the middle to denote their social status and senatorial class. Contrary to today, when men wearing dresses are considered to be more feminine, in ancient Rome, wearing the white and red toga of the senator was seen as an expression of power and masculinity. Only men could be senators, and the senators were the ones who ran the republic, at least in theory. Roman soldiers also marched into battle and conquered new territories, activities which even the noisiest daily wire grifter wouldn't dare to disagree are masculine, wearing what were basically pleated leather skirts and sandals. I mean, the whole gladiator sandal trend of modern times is inspired by this look. If anything, women nowadays dress like men did in the past, never mind men dressing like women, but we'll get to that later. Lest you mistakenly think that wearing skirts and dresses was just a weird thing that men of ancient cultures did because they were weird and unevolved, the medieval European menfolk wore skirts too, oh yes. And not only did they wear skirts and tunics, they also wore leggings and tights. The Bayo Tapestry, which dates back to the 11th century CE, depicts men wearing skirts and tunics over leggings in much the same way women of my generation did in high school back in the mid-aughts a la Ashley Tisdale. Between the 13th and 15th centuries, men's skirts started to get shorter and more flared, which allowed them to ride horses more comfortably. In Greece and in the Balkan states, a flared pleated skirt called a fustanella was worn by soldiers in much the same way those manly Roman dudes rocked their pleated leather miniskirts. Fustanellas actually had a moment a few years ago, back when we were all crazy for those like pleated satin midi skirts that we wore with big bulky sweaters and boots. Remember those? I think I actually have one in silver. Anyway, I digress. In the 16th century, Scottish 
kilts, those most famous of men's skirts, were documented as being worn for the first time. Side note, doesn't mean that's when they were actually worn for the first time, just that it's our first time getting any real documented evidence of them from the historical record. And then we have the 17th century. Oh, the 17th century. The leggings and tunic look was in full swing, made even more manly by the addition of red high heels introduced by the fashion forward King Louis XIV of France. This is the guy who put France on the map when it comes to fashion, but that's another video for another time. Let me know in the comments below if you want to hear more about that. At a time in history when women were tucking their hair into demure little white linen caps and wearing muted, understated colors, men were going wild with long curly wigs and tights that showed off their muscular, manly thighs and pink velvet waistcoats embroidered with flowers. And don't forget the makeup. Oh yes, during the 17th and 18th centuries, fashionable, i.e. wealthy European men wore white face paint, pink blush, and red lipstick to demonstrate their manliness. Makeup was expensive back then. I mean, it still is today. Shout out to NARS for being awesome and unaffordable and wearing it communicated wealth, status, and power. If Matt Walsh stumbled into a time machine and launched himself back to the year 1775, all the manly men at court would have assumed he was just some average Joe peasant and looked down their noses at him. Even though the 18th century seems like a long time ago, especially in our post-pandemic world where like time has no meaning, it actually wasn't that long ago at all, maybe about five or six generations back. So somehow, between the time when your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather walked the earth in his pantyhose and high heels and today, tights and high heels went from being the epitome of manliness to the epitome of femininity. So how did that happen? Well, I, along with many fashion historians, are inclined to blame Beau Brummel. Bo Brummel. If you've ever done even the most casual of Google searches about men's fashion, you definitely would have come across the name Bo Brummel. And that's because this dude was famous, or rather infamous, for pretty much ruining clothes for men forever, which is why men's clothes today are so boring. Born in the year 1778 in England, he reigned supreme over men's fashion during the Regency period. If any of you watching this are Jane Austen stands like me, all those tailored waistcoats and top hats and shiny black boots and long pants worn by the likes of Mr. Darcy and Colonel Brandon were directly influenced by Beau Brummel. Brummel befriended the Prince Regent while serving in the military where he impressed him with his cavalier attitude towards his duties and by the force of his personality, like this dude just did not give a fuck about anything except his waistcoats, apparently. Even though he came from a beer budget background, he had very champagne tastes, and the prince was fascinated by him. Brummel ended up wielding massive influence over the prince, who rushed to copy almost everything he did in war, thereby setting the tone for every other dude in the British Empire as well. If you ask me, it kind of sounds like Bo and his prince had a little something-something going on, which is an amusing thought when you consider the fact that Bo's aesthetic became the foundation for masculine fashion for straight dudes right up until today. When Candace Owens went on her little ranty rant about men going woke and not looking masculine anymore, what she was really saying is that she's disappointed that men today are starting to dress more like Roman soldiers and less like a queer dude from the Regency period. Beau Brummel rejected the ornate clothing of the Georgian period, eschewing the powdered wigs and tights and heavily embroidered... <coughs> oh my god heavily embroidered jackets and makeup that had been the standard for menswear for the past two centuries. Instead, he preferred simple, understated, but immaculately tailored pantsuits in dark colors contrasted with immaculate white cravats. He wore his hair in a short cropped style. Before that, men had worn their locks long and curly, often tying them back into a ponytail with like cute little silk ribbons. His style of dress was influenced by the Great Male Renunciation, i.e. the Manosphere 1.0, where men all across Europe renounced bright colors, embellishments, and variety in their clothing, leaving those things to women's fashions. Instead of focusing on accessories, trimmings, and overall aesthetics, they all adopted the pantsuit uniform and focused on tiny details like the cut and quality of fabric to differentiate themselves from one another. The menfolk relinquished their claim to beauty, which up until that point had not been a gendered thing. Both men and women tried their best to be beautiful for like most of human history. And instead of that, they focused on utility and usefulness. Prioritizing usefulness over beauty might seem to us like a masculine trait, but that has nothing to do with sex, gender, or biology, and everything to do with history and culture. It begs the question, what happened at the end of the 18th century to change men's relationship to their clothing? The Enlightenment. I've talked about the Enlightenment in a few different videos already because it had a huge impact not just on the development of modern Western democracies, but also on every aspect of our lives today, including what we wear and what we consider to be masculine versus feminine. 
During the Enlightenment period, social hierarchies were being called into question in like very deep and revolutionary ways, and anything that signaled aristocratic status fell out of fashion very quickly. We see the first waves of this during the French Revolution when working class men proudly wore the long trousers associated with laborers, rejecting the knee breeches and stockings that were worn by aristocratic and even middle class men. They called themselves the sans culottes, literally the ones without breeches, and wearing long pants was a signal to others that you were down with the philosophies of the revolution, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. In some cases, not wearing long pants could actually get you guillotined because the French Revolution was basically one of those you're either with us or you're the enemy type of situations. The French Revolution had been largely influenced by the American Revolution, during which the British colonies separated and formed their own republic, which is now the United States. We all know that story, blah blah, that's old news. Anyway, one of the most influential political figures of the American Revolution was Benjamin Franklin, and in 1778, he visited Versailles to personally request military assistance assistance in his war against the British from King Louis the 16th. This dude took the court by storm in his long pants, simple suit jacket, natural unpowdered hair, and beaver hats. In a court full of elaborately dressed men, his simplicity and utilitarian aesthetic really stood out, and you best believe this dude got laid. The thing is, unlike Beau Brummel, Benjamin Franklin wasn't actually trying to make a fashion statement. The dude just straight up did not care what he looked like or what he wore because he grew up in a backwater colony far away from the European centers of power and arbiters of fashion. He was a true enlightenment man in the sense that he renounced his powdered wigs in order to look less upper class at a time in history when power was shifting from the landed aristocracy to middle class businessmen and lawyers. Enlightenment philosophy was based on the idea of rationality as being a virtue. Philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau argued that there was no rational basis for the idea of birthright and that being born into a certain bloodline didn't automatically make someone a good leader or more worthy of privilege and power. It's sound reasoning, and a lot of what these guys argued for makes a lot of sense. That being said, literally every problem we face as a society today is a result of Enlightenment philosophy being taken way too far, and I will die on this hill. Before the end of the 18th century, we were actually making a lot of social progress in the areas of LGBTQIA plus acceptance, feminism, and social mobility. Hear me out. Before the French Revolution, women could and did have careers and support themselves financially. Both men and women could and did apprentice themselves in a trade under the guild system and work their way up to become business owners and entrepreneurs. One of the wealthiest women in late 18th century Europe was Rose Bertin, Marie Antoinette's dressmaker, who started out life as the daughter of a lowly policeman and ended up being wealthier than the queen herself. Polyamory was widely accepted, and there were lots of social scripts and examples of how to conduct multiple romantic relationships at once because of the proliferation of arranged marriages. No one blinked an eye at cross-dressing, and nothing was cooler than a man who dressed in women's clothing like the Chevalier Dayan. That's like a whole video in and of itself. Let me know if you want to hear about his life, because the dude was awesome. It was considered perfectly normal and even healthy for women to have close, intimate friendships with other women, and there was a whole genre of pseudo-sapphic literature from the late 18th century about women's relationships with one another. Now, all of this progress was concentrated at the top of society and embraced by the aristocracy, which of course opens up a whole discussion about wealth, privilege, and power, which I do not have time to get into in this particular video. Editing Megan here, the whole topic of social, sexual, and gender progressivism in the late 18th century is actually super interesting, and there's like a lot more depth and nuance to it than I had the chance to get into in this video. So if that's something that you would be interested in seeing, drop me a comment below because I can do a whole video that just talks about that. So yeah, let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in seeing. All this to say that while the upper classes were socially quite progressive, even if politically very conservative, the working classes, on the other hand, tended to be more socially conservative, but more politically progressive. They quite rightly wanted equality and liberty in the political sense, meaning that they wanted to be able to have a say in how their country was run and change the law so that everyone was treated equally and there were no special privileges for the aristocrats. But in terms of how people actually conducted themselves in society, the working classes tended to be quite conservative. This is very different from how it is today because nowadays if you're politically liberal then you're probably also socially liberal. 
I'm sure someone somewhere out there is a staunch Bernie supporter and also a conservative Catholic, but that is not the norm by any means. In late 18th century France, though, it would have been. And if this was late 18th century France, the Daily Wire crew would all be enthusiastic supporters of trans and queer people, while at the same time arguing that authoritarian dictators make the best leaders. This is basically how things were at the end of the 18th century when men's fashion began to change. Those who did support the revolution and the Enlightenment were rebelling not just against the political domination, but also the culture of the aristocracy. Things like sapphic relationships, cross-dressing, and polyamory were seen as being hedonistic aristocratic nonsense that served no purpose other than self-gratification and all the social progress that had been set in motion was vehemently rejected by the revolutionaries in favor of enlightenment ideas at its core enlightenment philosophy is about preserving the natural order of things Rousseau's writings are centered around the idea of returning to the natural state, and this influenced everything from fashion to gardening to politics to philosophies on child rearing. And naturally, part of embracing a more natural state is a monogamous relationship between a cis man and a cis woman forged for the purpose of birthing and raising cishet babies who can grow up to become good citizens of a democratic state. Rousseau used the theory of gender complementarity to base his idea of the two spheres, the public and private. The public sphere of the commercial economy and state was to be driven by men and their rational calculation and self-interest. The principles by which the public sphere should be governed were laid out in the social contract published in 1762. The private sphere of the family was to be driven by women due to their natural virtues. Sound familiar? If it doesn't, just go pursue some trad wife TikToks and it'll be familiar in no time. Editing Megan coming at you again. I just uploaded everything to YouTube and then got a copyright claim for one of the TikTok videos that I included in this little upcoming segment. So I'm going to just do a voiceover and mute the audio so that I don't get punished for this. So the next 10 seconds will just be me talking. So apologies for that. Um, the music was much better, but y'all gotta live with this. Five ways to submit to your husband. One, let him take the lead. Two, don't criticize or nag him. Three, value his input and yield to his desires. Four, listen intently to his thoughts. Five, speak well of him to others. Baby, I'm yours. Baby, I'm Democracy itself was seen as being the closest thing to a state of nature because it allows man to govern himself rather than to be governed by the whims of a dictator who was born to privilege. I'm deliberately using gendered language here, by the way. While I am certainly a very socialist-leaning, enthusiastic supporter of democracy, back in the 18th century, women were not allowed to participate in the democratic process at all. Why? Because according to Enlightenment philosophy, women are inherently irrational, emotional creatures who lack the logic and rationality needed to properly run a democratic nation. Through Emile, Rousseau was demonstrating that through the proper education, men's reason could be cultivated to make them in charge of these destructive passions, thus making them free individuals. Women, however, could not develop in the same way as he believed they could not be capable of abstract reasoning, therefore could not achieve freedom. However, by retaining their natural virtue, they could achieve happiness in a way that men could not. For this reason, Rousseau believed that women who tried to cultivate their reason were foolish. By defying their nature, they were deserting happiness that only they could enjoy. Enlightenment philosophers argued that women were frivolous and emotional, whereas men were rational and logical. So when that became the dominant cultural ideal, men began to renounce the colorful, complicated clothing that was worn by the upper classes in favor of more functional, utilitarian outfits that demonstrated how logical and down-to-earth they were. All of a sudden, masculinity was ascribed to this quality of rationality, and we still haven't quite managed to separate ourselves from that all the way up to today. There is no scientific or biological evidence for this. Being rational and down-to-earth is a personality trait, not a sex characteristic. Yet somehow we not only still ascribe it to masculinity, but actually idealize it. There's nothing actually wrong with being frivolous or flashy. Expressing yourself through your appearance is just another way to communicate with people in your immediate environment. It's a way to make art to play to have fun those things are not gender yet they're still seen as being feminine i.e somehow being lesser hi welcome to sephora can i help you oh shit wow you're like wearing makeup yes so i'm like not gay but like do you have a moisturizer for like guys or whatever yeah we have some not gay moisturizers over here is there anything specific you're looking for 
What do you mean? Like, do you have a specific skin concern? My skin? No, it's just like, on my face. Bo Brummel was a product of Enlightenment philosophy. He was born and grew up during the time of the French Revolution, and even though he himself wasn't French, the tides of change were still sweeping across Europe, and it fundamentally changed how people lived, how they conducted their relationships, what they ate, what they read, what they learned at school, and what they wore. Beau Brummel's rejection of elaborate 18th century aristocratic fashions wasn't unique to him, but we still blame him for why men's fashions are so boring now, because he had so much influence both politically and socially. The Prince Regent copied everything he did in war, so therefore every man in England who could afford it also copied everything he did in war, and Beau Brummel's muted, pared-down aesthetic became the new standard for men's clothing, which has barely budged in like 230 years. Anything elaborate, anything colorful, embellished, or flashy, or requiring multiple layers was seen as feminine and therefore frivolous and therefore irrational and undesirable. Never mind that Beau Brummel was probably queer, God forbid he should look like it. Long pants and a suit jacket had officially replaced the skirt and leggings as the epitome of masculinity, and that takes us all the way up to today and Candace Owens' meltdown about the disappearance of manly men. When we actually take the time to break it all down though, what becomes screamingly obvious is that there's no actual set definition for what masculinity even is. If Matt Walsh can walk around like the fleet admiral of all the douche canoes asking people what a woman is, if one person can tell me what a woman is, then it's perfectly reasonable for us to pose the following question. What is a man then? What does it mean to be masculine? To the ancient Egyptians, it meant putting on eyeliner and wearing a long skirt. To the ancient Romans, it meant wearing a white dress with a red stripe down the middle. To the powerful men at the court of Versailles, it meant wearing high heels, tights, and makeup. The entire point that I'm trying to make here is that the qualities and presentations we ascribe to masculinity are not inherent biological traits. Like the idea of gender in general, it's a culturally constructed, socially engineered concept with a lot of historical context behind it that has no actual basis in biological reality. Our modern Western idea of masculinity comes from Enlightenment philosophy and is only actually about 200 years old, barely a blip in the entire span of human history. That's why it's so ridiculous when talking head fascists like the Daily Wire crew lament the loss of manly men, because historical context is important. Men aren't getting less masculine, they're just returning to an earlier pre-19th century definition and presentation of masculinity. I would pay good money to see Candace Owens or Matt Walsh or Ben and Shapiro magically go back in time and tell Julius Caesar that he's not very manly because he's wearing a pleated leather miniskirt. How do you think he'd respond to that? If your masculinity is so fragile that you can't even wear a non-bifurcated garment without melodramatically questioning your entire sexual and gender identity, then maybe you should take several seats and let someone else wear the pants while you calm down. That's going to do it for this one, my loves. Thank you for sitting all the way through this for like the 10 of you who do. I'm almost at my goal of 1,000 subscribers finally, so thank you to everyone who's supported the channel so far. If you liked this video and want to see more like it, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up button, and let me know in the comments what you think about men wearing skirts again. I hope you all have a wonderful day wherever you are and whatever you're doing, and I will see you in the next one. Toodaloo!